Four Corners podcast. This is the country with the worst PR in the world. You have an educated workforce that costs you less than in Vietnam. Do you think the financial bodies in Iran have the ability to anticipate what the lifting of sanctions could mean? I think that the bubble will happen at some point. It will be a huge boom for many exporters. Some companies will definitely get hurt. Do you see any signals right now from a Biden administration as to what he may do with Iran? The Middle East is actually not that important for them anymore. They may be stepping aside. Iranian GCC relations. Leaders don't change as often as they do in the West. They have monarchies and they have institutions which seldom change. This will never happen again. The situation in a couple of years' time will be completely different. Welcome, everybody, to our second podcast of the Four Corners podcast. We have a very interesting guest today. And we're going to be covering a topic which doesn't get too much exposure. So today we have Maciej Wojtal, and he, he is the founder and CIO of Amtel, Amtelon Capital. It is a um, fund that focuses on investing in the Iranian market and exclusively in the Iranian market. This is something that many investors have shunned over the years due to really bad PR of Iran. But uh, Mache is going to dive into the topic of why Iran is actually a hidden gem in the investing world and what investors need to really understand about this region in order to benefit from its isolation and also its potential opening up as the years progress. So thank you very much, Machel, and uh, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you. Hello, Chrisman. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Great. Wonderful. So... You have found a really interesting niche in the investing world uh, that is obviously investing in Iran. Can you, within sort of 45 seconds, can you go through how you got to the conclusion that Iran is you know, the best uh, kept secret in the investing world? Uh, yes, sure. I'll, I'll try to do it in 45 seconds, but it's... Uh much more than um, that I'm able to say in that period of time. So look, um, um, Iran opened up in 2016 um, after U.S. sanctions were lifted by Obama administration, sorry, U.N. sanctions were lifted under Obama administration, U.S. sanctions were still on. And um, this was an important moment because um, at that time it became illegal for everyone who is not a U.S. person to do business with Iran, to invest there and so on. So um, I got interested because I have invested in many other countries, emerging countries, frontier markets, uh, such as uh, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, China, Asia is very early when it was still difficult to get there, Philippines, Vietnam, Kenya, and so on. Iran was always there as something potentially interesting, but uh, we couldn't really touch it, so so no one did any research. Now, in 2016, I got interested, and I did some research uh, because I knew that there was a stock market. What I found was a really well-organized market uh, with decent liquidity. At that time, it was trading at roughly $100 million per day, um, uh, a market cap of around $100 billion, uh, um, and 600 uh, companies listed across more than 50 different industries. So I was amazed because, you know, you can get bullish on some emerging uh, frontier markets, such as, I don't know, Myanmar, for example, or maybe, you know, North Korea when it opens up. But usually there is nothing to do there for portfolio investors, right? You can go there and build a factory, maybe maybe launch a startup, right? And and in Iran, uh, you suddenly have a pretty liquid, well-organized um, capital market with uh, you know two stock exchanges uh, with a proper regulatory oversight. So that was amazing. But obviously, um, the thing that attracted me the most were the valuations. So this was by far the cheapest market in the world. And I'm talking about, you know, uh, companies trading at four times earnings, paying 20% dividend yields uh, wow. without having any significant debt. Obviously, there is no hard currency debt. Um, also, not much local debt because, you know, with interest rates at 30%, there is just impossible to finance any meaningful uh, leverage. Um, so that was it. And and on top of that, there was no, no foreign investors over there. So Foreign investors were less than half a percent of the market cap of the local of the, of the local stock exchange, um, which meant that you know all the flows that will happen they still haven't happened. It will all come later, right? So I saw a a a chance to position early uh, with limited investment risks because of very low valuations. With at that time it looked as 
improving geopolitics because we were straight after um, you know implementation of of, of the nuclear deal, um, and uh, with the local market it is very inefficient uh, because of no institutional investors. There. Yeah, it so took more than forty five seconds. Listen, you gave such a great um, such a great uh, analysis that you know will allow you for the forty five seconds. That's fine. So when you look at the market in Iran now, do you see a situation where you have some already established companies which are taking advantage of the fact that there are high interest rates, uh, the fact that there is pretty much very isolationist due to sanctions, which means the startup environment in Iran is, um, is very lackluster because there's not too much incentive in order to start something new due to the financial restrictions and the conditions. Does this give a chance for the more established companies to really win in the long term and capture the majority of the market? And because the market, because the conditions for startups and competitors, whether it be external competitors or even internal competitors, are so stifled. Is that the situation you see? Well, that depends on the industry. Certain industries are just impossible to get in. Uh, into uh, obviously the energy industry. I mean, uh, the energy sector is controlled by, you know, the local centers of power. Let's say whether this is the um, um, central administration, the government, um, or whether this these are the revolutionary guards. Um, so energy is a no go. Also, a big part of infrastructure when it, when it comes to. Um, you know, construction companies that do big infrastructure projects, they are usually linked one way or another to, to the state. Um, um, these are also the sectors that you really wouldn't be able to get into because those are the sectors that are still covered by U.S. sanctions. So mm. if you don't want to violate those sanctions, you, 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 you have a list of restrictions that you need to follow. Um, when it comes to other sectors, it's different. So... Um, on one hand, you have big companies uh, that dominate petrochemical sector but in the consumer business you actually have plenty of startups and are and they are quite vibrant so what happens is that look I, I, iranians is a great population they are super entrepreneurial and um, um there's plenty of groups that are looking for su successful startups in the west and just try to implement the same model um in iran um, there are local groups that are trying to do something, something new, something, something different. The thing that they are missing, I would say the most, is access to funding. Mm. So when you have startups that have some backing from foreign investors, which is not too many, obviously, but there are some, they are very often linked to Iranian diaspora somewhere in, you know, in, 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 in Canada or in Germany, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. um, then they are doing better. Because, because they have access to funding, uh, the market is uh, not saturated with uh, more uh, like, you know, modern concepts. So look, that, that, let me tell you maybe about the biggest success story. It's, it's called Snap. Snap is exactly the same as Uber. Uber meaning uh, taxis and food delivery. Mm -hmm. So Snap, um, I think they have 2 million rides per day. Wow. Um, and I don't, and I don't remember whether this is all of Iran or just Tehran. Mm -hmm. So they're really, really dom they they've grown massively. They dominated the market. They're a huge company right now. Mm -hmm. There is another one called Digicala, which is um, which is like an Amazon, uh, which uh, was growing super strongly. Then they got hurt by sanctions, which um, uh, limited the ability of them to import goods. Uh, from other countries and and uh, that they were selling on their platform, uh, but yes, there is a couple of examples of really good companies and a long list of small startups that are trying to uh, to grow as well. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. Do you give do you give um, much thought to the fact that unlike its GCC neighbors like Saudi Arabia, oil only makes up something like eighteen to twenty percent of Iran's GDP? Uh, because it's a very diversified uh, economy, because they can't obviously rely on oil only. Do you give that spread of industry, uh, do you give uh, credit to the current establishment of Iran? Or do you think this was inbuilt even during the Shah's time and Mohammed Mossadegh's time, where they felt that they needed a more diversified economy because they couldn't rely on oil as their main uh, source of income? Where did this... Uh, stark uh, contrast come, especially with uh, oil being such a big commodity for Iran, but yet it's not the biggest, um, you know, uh, biggest income for the nation. 
that diversified economy is that the is that the the um, the good works of the current administration? Is that the good works of a, uh, a of a population which has has initiative, or is that just due to its historical di diversity that is just um, being benefited by the past today? Yes. So. Um First of all, um, two things. So it's no longer 18 to 20 percent. After sanctions, I think it's probably like five percent or, okay. or something like this. The, mm. um, um, yeah, the oil part in the in the GDP. Um, secondly, they didn't really have a choice. Um, so one thing is, you know, when when did this actually start? But but, but another thing, look, this country has been under some sort of sanctions for. 40 years 40 pretty years, much yeah. so yeah they had to uh so they were cut off and most of the time they were cut off very strongly from um banking reconnections um from um, large export markets so they had to develop um all the most of these um, you know important parts of the of the economy so they have to develop their own industries look mm. this is what russia learned a couple of years ago when sanctions were imposed on Russia, and and suddenly they were no longer able to import certain products, right? Mm. I was I was chatting with some Russians from Moscow, and they were complaining, look, there is no cheese, you know, in Moscow, no good cheese, and so on. But mm -hmm. but they actually developed many of the industries, including uh, the food industry, um, very strongly, thanks to sanctions. So this is like, um, you know. There are good things coming from being under sanctions for so long, and yeah. these may be also un unintended consequences. Because when you put oh, but this is probably not possible for every country, right? Iran has scale; it's big enough, right? It's 84 million people, so um, local companies can um, um, have big enough market. Even when they are focused on the local market, they can grow enough uh, to make it to make it uh, you know sensible, right? To 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 have enough scale. Yeah. But it's not only not only the Iranian market. Look, so Iran, you know, used to be Persia. Uh, you know, five thousand years of history, at least the written one, uh, and probably much longer than that. Um, they have very good relations and trading connections with the whole region. So Iran is 84 million people, but Iran and all the other neighbors is 550 million people. It's like the second Europe, right? Yeah. And and yeah. Iran has 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 natural historical uh, links to all of these markets. So local Iranian companies not only sell to Iranian consumers. But um, a lot of them also export in the region, yeah. and this regional export um, is not affected by sanctions because I mean it's not easy to track you know someone who is selling you know some goods to Afghanistan or Iraq. And think about Afghanistan and Iraq. You know these are um, not developed countries, but they have 80 million people, and these people consume stuff. And because they don't have much production, they have to import most of it, and most of it is coming from Iran. Then you have Turkey, the size of Iran. Then you have. Uh, you know, towards uh, Uzbekistan, where many people speak Farsi as a second language, yeah. right? Obviously, Pakistan, a, 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 a big partner. Yeah. Um, then uh, in, in the Gulf, uh, well, the relations are mixed, but Dubai has historically been a strong um, um, a trading hub for Iran. Uh, then Oman also started playing yeah. this role, where they basically very often import goods from Iran. Yeah. We package them as, you know, some other origin and export it. Uh, somewhere, you know, to 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 Far East Asia. So, um, so just going back to your question, um, they didn't have a choice. This is one thing. So yes, the regime, uh, the current, you know, government, the administration that has been uh, the system that has been for the last forty years, um, um, allowed for the economy to 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 adjust itself to the environment that they were um, that. Um, they were positioned in. Um, so, so yes, you could say that they did a good job, but it wasn't really up to them. They yeah. didn't really have a choice. Yeah. And people had to survive, right? So they had to start, they, they started manufacturing their own, uh, you know, uh, machinery parts, ingredients, and so on. It's not always great. I mean, I try to avoid domestic flights because they have a very high uh, crash ratio um, uh, for the domestic flights because, because of sanctions, because they are unable to import 
uh, spare parts for for those old planes. Yeah. But anyway, so this is it. And going back, you know, um, longer in history, I mean, you know, Persians. I think they had the first uh, highways, uh, so those caravans could just travel much uh, much faster. So yeah. you know, it's 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 probably in the blood as yeah. well. Yeah, that's, that's a good analysis of that. When I see the political situation in the Middle East, especially when you look at Iranian GCC relations, there's one thing that uh, is similar to all of them, and that is the fact that you know their leaders don't change as often as they do in the West. Uh, they have monarchies, and they have uh, you know they have um, institutions which seldom change. The only time that they change is if if a leader passes away, and that's taken on by someone in the family. Given that animosities between, let's say, Saudi and Iran are very very high, and given that the political leaderships are very unlikely to change over the next uh, ten fifteen years, this trajectory of animosity being expressed through um, through sometimes kinetic means, uh, through sometimes you know trade means through uh, also isolating GCC neighbors because they have relations with Iran, so proxy measures in order to influence uh, regional uh, neighbor, uh, neighbors in the region who may be affiliated with Iran and vice versa. How do you see this playing out in the next 10 years, let's say, if you were to look as far as that? How much impact does Saudi have on the Iranian market? Or do their influence stop does that do, does that influence really stop at the door of, of politics and trade relations aren't really as connected anyway so there'll be no way of them interfering with one another as they develop their economies well it's a it's a complex question yeah. it's a very complex situation because um so maybe there is not much direct relation between the saudis and iran in terms of trade for example but then Saudis have relations with the U.S. Yeah. Iran has, well, its own relations with the U.S. Um, and then U.S. Is, is an important player in the region. Now, what is also changing uh, is both countries have a strong relation with China. And China is becoming even more dominant player in the region. Um, then between Saudi and Iran, okay, one thing is that they have this very long term um you know i i don't want to call it competition let's say or a disagreement who has the more important um um you know m- 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 part of the muslim religion whether it's shia which is morally in iran or sunni uh, which is saudi it's the same as in you know maybe not the same but similar to european um uh, discussions uh, you know, between Catholics and Protestants uh, a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but there is also domestic issues. So you mentioned that there is no chance for uh, the change in the leadership. Well, in Iran, there is uh, because of the age of the Supreme, supreme Leader. Yeah. Um, you know, he's um, he's an older person. I, I don't know, he's 87, maybe 85, um, who... Um, uh, I read was um, um, had had multiple operations, mm-hmm. including cancer operations. Yeah. Um, so, well, it's no secret that in the time frame that you mentioned, ten to fifteen years, there is a chance for some changes in Iran, and no one really knows how this will look like. Whether there will be a new supreme leader, whether there will be some sort of a council, uh, or maybe there will be some shift um, in 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 the power centers in Iran. Yeah, no one knows that, but it will be significant because the supreme leader really calls all the important shots in Iran. Um, another thing, domestic thing in both Saudi and Iran is 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 the population, the demographic structure of the population. These are young populations. You know, the median age in Iran is around thirty. Uh, in Saudi, it's even less. And younger people don't really relate that much to the same values the same for example in iran maybe they 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 have a bit different approach to revolutionary values um so i think this will make the systems change a bit i i and so i'm not saying that the systems will change uh but they will have to adjust 
um, uh, because because the younger populations have different aspirations and different ambitions and different you know models that they would like to follow. Um, and it's only positive, in my opinion. It's only positive because they they want to be part of of of, of something that they aspire to. Very often, it's linked to um, um, you know being more open to other countries, both to the Western countries, but also in the region. Uh, now, the U.S. situation is obviously changing um, massively, and I think that uh, it has start it started some time ago, uh, probably when the U.S. became independent. Uh, in terms of its energy supplies. So, well, they still have to import oil, but on a net basis, they are pretty much independent. So the Middle East is actually not that important for them anymore. Um, so it may also be more uh, difficult to politically justify, you know, sending troops and risking lives of, you know, young American soldiers in any conflict in, 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 in the Gulf. So I think that... Um, it's obviously a very long-term process, but they may be um, stepping aside. And it should be in Europe's interest and also in China's interest because they need to secure many sources, alternative sources of energy um, to, um, to be more involved in the Middle yeah. East. Um, now with, with the change from Trump to Biden, um, there, may, there may be, I mean, we'll see, but um, it looks like there will be... Uh, some 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 different principles, let's say, uh, by which the U.S. administration uh, will act. Uh, maybe it will be also less transactional. They are already. I think the news was out yesterday that they are reviewing uh, arms sales to both Saudi and UAE um, uh, to also put some pressure on ending the conflict in Yemen. Um, so um, also there is a, a there is a chance uh, and, and a big hope that. Um, they will get back to the nuclear deal, the original nuclear deal, or or if not the original one, then something maybe something new at some point. Yeah. Um, so the, the so the U.S. angle is changing as well. Then you have China, which is investing a lot into, on one hand, um, securing uh, supplies of energy, and Chinese are talking uh, to both Iran and Saudi. They don't want to you know pick one of those sides. Yeah. They 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 just want a lot of you know alternatives and 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 the security um they are you know taking advantage for example of iran's uh, weaker negotiating position yeah. and and would love to persuade the country to accept payments in in the Ch chinese currency um on the other hand they are building uh, the belt and road uh, you know around uh, across asia yeah. and iran is a, is an important part of it so there is already the train going from Shanghai to to Tehran, yeah. and then it will um, uh, go towards uh, towards Europe. So there is plenty of, of of different angles, and they're they are all changing. So so it will be actually I'm I'm pretty sure that that the picture will change over the next you know decade or two yeah. in, in the Middle East. Yeah, you're right in saying that, because although the United States has tried to isolate Iran as much as it can. Nevertheless, it's still the, the nation of Iran, you know, the, uh, the nation of Iran really is centered to a lot of other economic and geopolitical developments in the world. Obviously, as you mentioned, China, with its need for secure, reliable and cheap oil, that, uh, that's also the case for Japan, which produces, you know, zero, uh, you know, natural resources in terms of uh, oil and gas. And also the fact that Europe has a a part to play. So these are the so the centers the, the centers of uh, political power and economic power all have an interest in in having Iran be be stable. Sometimes not so stable to get its benefits out of it. Saying that, what do you think are the biggest questions that your clients and your investors ask you about the developments in Iran and? Do you see a difference in terms of the the the, the kind of investor that asks you questions? Um, what are they What are they worried about? What kinds of questions are they asking you, especially in this transitional period, where the EU is still trying to find its voice in terms of what it does in terms of foreign relations as Brexit happened and Britain is now a independent nation. Um, the Americans obviously had a new change of leadership. Also, what kinds of questions do you hear from your clients? In regards to the region and the potential 
for Iranian development in the future? Yes. So investors in general don't want to lose their money. Um, <laughs> Naturally. They, so they would be afraid of investment risks and some other risks. Yeah. In Iran, it's usually the other risks. because um, So one thing is geopolitics, right? Under the previous US administration, the question was, okay, would, will, the, will there be war, for example, or some big conflict in, in, yeah. in the region? Yeah. Uh, and if it happens, how can we get our money out, right? If, uh, for example, all the banking relations stop, uh, everything stops, what we can do? So like really painting the worst case scenario, uh, which, was, which, which I think was never probable even under, under Trump administration, but but this this was maybe very low probability, but but like the worst case scenario, even that they 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 always wanted to uh, talk over, um, and also okay geopolitics sanctions. What if the sanctions intensify? What will be the impact? Because when you look when you read about Iran in the press, it's almost always bad news, right? This is the country with the worst PR in the world, right? Yeah. So it's either only politics and it's always bad yeah. or economy how it is hurt by sanctions you know gdp fell by eight percent over the last four years and so on okay fine but this is actually easy to explain because the non-oil part of the gdp actually expanded and a lot of companies benefit from a weaker local currency that is getting hit by sanctions because this improves their competitiveness and they make more money or increase volumes that they are able to export abroad um, um, so, um, also, um, what if, what if, uh, you know, sanctions intensify, there is not really much to sanction left, um, after, uh, you know, the maximum pressure campaign of the, of the Trump administration. And the good thing for investors is that the currency dropped by 85% over the previous four years. So really a lot of bad news has been priced in. Um, can it drop further? Yes, of course. But it just tells you that the majority of the impact has has been priced in. Uh, so these are the investment risks. Um, uh, when it uh, when it comes to and geopolitical risks, um, when it comes to you know those worst case scenarios, I never believed that there was a significant chance for a military conflict. Uh, on one hand, because Iran doesn't want a conflict, and it's not a type of country that goes to war that initiates conflicts with other countries. They haven't been to a, let's say, a, a, an open war since uh, you know the 80s uh, yeah. when they were fighting with uh, Saddam Hussein uh, in Iraq, uh, and 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 it's also it was it was Hussein who initiated the the, the war. Um, another thing is that all the countries in the Gulf, even when the relations are tough, I think that they understand that none of them can afford a an open military conflict. Look what happened. It was um, a year and a half ago, almost a year and a half ago, when there was a lot of pressure put on Iran. And then there was this uh, drone attack on uh, Saudi Aramco uh, refining facilities. Yeah. Uh, well, Iran never claimed it, but everyone believes it was it was most, most likely Iran. Um, look, it, it was most of, you know, Saudi's GDP, right? This this big the, the main refinery, yeah. and it was easy to attack it with a drone, yeah. and that's it. And uh, and 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 the country uh, economically is shut down. Yeah. Uh, and this was the refinery. Now think about other targets that are very easy in 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 the region. I mean, water desalination, yeah. uh, you know, um, Ports, uh, facilities like this, or yeah. um, um, uh, electricity uh, power plants, right? If you don't have water and and air conditioning, I mean, people are unable to survive in this region, right? So, it, when 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 they start shooting each other and, and at those at those targets, everyone will lose, right? Yeah. So this was also and also what was what was very visible after the Aramco thing. There was no reaction, no reaction from the Saudis, no reaction from the U.S. Yes. So the Saudis potentially were waiting for the U.S. to do something. The U.S. did nothing, meaning that. Okay, yes, we will, you know, protect you, defend you, and so on. But then there was no action, right, to to back up those those statements. Yeah. Obviously, a couple of a couple of months later, there was uh, the assassination of Soleimani. So yeah. maybe maybe that was the the answer. But but no immediate response. I think this also 
um, this also changed the, the, the regional mindset, or maybe it made everyone understand that, okay, they have to actually, it's up to them uh, to, to, to keep the peace and to keep the right relations. So they cannot wait for any other third, you know, superpower or some third party yeah, yeah. to come and, um, and, and, and sort out the relations between them. They will be their neighbors. They will be their own neighbors forever yeah. and they'll have to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's why that's why I never thought that th there was a, a, a real chance for a, for an open conflict. Yeah. But obviously, those proxy fights, those cyber you know conflicts, yeah. uh, they are they are going on all the time. Yeah, and this will yeah. probably continue. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we have Yemen, Lebanon, uh, 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 Iraq, and also the cyber um, activities. Syria, Syria, obviously as well. I mean, the region. I mean, I think Iran, Iran plays very close to what it knows. It's very, you don't really see it go beyond the Middle Eastern region uh, for many different reasons. But you mentioned in your answer before that due to the sanctions that Iran has, has been facing, it's allowed for an ecosystem of self-reliance to develop in the country, just like Russia, uh, with its sanctions in 2014 after the annexation of uh, Crimea. So we see a lot of indigenous companies benefiting from the lack of imports so they can develop uh, you know, market share in their part of the, in, in their region and also in the neighbor in the neighboring regions where because it may have, have it may have more more capital now at its disposal because it's making more money it can then invest into exports uh into their neighboring countries which is a good thing for them if sanctions are lifted tomorrow let's just say in in, in an upside down world the u.s sanctions are lifted tomorrow naturally what i think you'll agree we'll see is massive influx of uh, of capital and of businesses entering iran you know, Iran will then be 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 listed in uh, in different you know in the MSCI uh, Emerging Markets Index and other sorts of uh, indices and um, categorizations for investors to put their money into. This, from my point of view, could lead to a bubble, obviously, of asset prices. Which I guess for you, if you know when to sell at the best time, you could make a killing. But do you think there's any opportunities for Iran to impose? Um, restrictions to incoming capital, just so that they manage their growth uh, more uh, more reliably, as opposed to accepting this capital. And actually, we're speaking in um, make believe right now, because or we're strategizing for what could be in the future. But do you think, just to wrap up this question more coherently, do you think the financial uh, bodies in Iran? have the ability to anticipate what the lifting of sanctions could mean and do you think they would be able to, to respond in a way that accepts this capital but at the same time not leading it to a bubble which it would inevitably lead to when excitement grows and short-term thinking takes place what is the state of the financial regulators and of the uh, financial heads in the country when it comes time to developing their markets if and when sanctions are lifted from Iran by a Biden administration? Yes. I think that the bubble will happen at some point. I hope that not too early. We are hoping to raise much bigger assets before this happens. Um, but but look, you look at China, Russia, when they were Poland, you know, many markets, when they were opening up to foreign investors, there was usually a bubble because they were starting from very low valuations up to very high valuations, yeah. then a sell-off, and then some gradual continuation of growth. Yeah. Um, so um, I think it will happen. Now, we are some time before that, and, and the changes will be gradual. So right now, what I expect is that more foreign investors will start, start investing in Iran, not only the portfolio investors that will buy local stocks and bonds and so on, but also... Um, in um, foreign foreign direct investments, basically. Um, look, Iran, so for European companies, for example, Iran is 84 million consumers. Um, but even more importantly right now, you have a very um, uh, educated workforce that costs you less than in Vietnam. I mean, it's a no-brainer for all the big European companies to locate 
uh, facilities over there, production facilities, and exports from Iran, whether these are cars or anything else. You know, it's a, it's a bit like Eastern Europe in the 90s for, yeah. for many German companies, yeah. right? Initially, um, much cheaper workforce. Yeah. And then when those, um, when, those, when those populations get more wealthy, they become a big consumer market. And it's, again, not only the Iranian consumer market, but also, but also all the other countries around Iran from, um, uh, to, to, to where from Iran it's easy to export. Um, so, so I think that um, the change in the U.S. administration, even if the New Deal will take some, some time, I mean, I don't know how long it will take, but I, but I expect that it will take uh, some time. The important thing will be that the, the rhetoric changes. So from Trump, very aggressive, almost warlike rhetoric to, you know, Biden. I imagine Biden going out, smiling and saying, look, guys, if we play this right, we may have a deal at some point down the line, right? And this, I think this will be a green light for many European and Asian investors yeah. for whom it's legal from the sanctions perspective to get involved in many industries in Iran yeah. um, to, just, to just make the move. Um, and now, how, 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 how this will be impact local companies and local, for example, stock market. Um, so yes, on one hand, you may have a more competition and some companies that are just inefficiently managed will definitely get hurt. Um, but when export markets open up, it will be a huge boom for many exporters that um, for now you have many companies that operate at uh, you know 50% capacity. Uh, because they they are just unable to sell higher volumes because of um, um, uh, export restrictions. So even if they no longer benefit from the continuing rise of the dollar, so I would assume that at some point the currency will stabilize. Uh, probably it will stabilize um, already this year. Stabilize meaning it, that it will be depreciating by I don't know uh, you know anywhere between ten and thirty percent per year. Um, and, um, so 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 the local exporters cannot count on this automatic earnings growth coming from the currency, local currency depreciation, but they will benefit from volumes growth because more markets will open up yeah. to importing Iranian goods. Um, so, so this is one positive. Another thing is that when, when foreign companies start entering the market, there are many obvious takeover targets in Iran. Yeah. You can lit literally buy, um, the majority of many different industries. I mean, the major, the, the 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 dominating market share yeah. in many different industries, whether these are you know trucks or um, um, uh, consumer staples, yeah. um, for you know several hundred million dollars. Um, it's really for big um, global companies. This is this is nothing, yeah. and they are securing. Uh, great distribution channels and 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 very often production facilities yeah. and so on. Yeah. So there is there is many like obvious takeover targets. Yeah. Um, so so then what will happen? What is needed for the biggest inflow of foreign money? So the big institutional investors and I mean you know BlackRock, Templeton, all the big big yeah. funds. Yeah. You you need a new deal between the U.S. and Iran yeah. because this will lift the U.S. sanctions. And the compliance departments in all the big companies will oh, say, they're, they're, yes, they're going to have the best ahead. time. Yeah, for sure. I and mean, if compliance is, is, is the biggest cost for any bank, any and any investor, uh, you know, to, to, to go on the wrong side of sanctions or the wrong side of compliance cost you a hefty fine and also bad re re reputational damage. But saying that, I wanted to ask, naturally, you can see the benefits from the West or the global West rather in terms of what benefits they can have in Iran. What what makes them think that the Iranian uh, establishment, political establishment, will just allow this to happen? Because surely, as sanctions are lifted, the establishment are going to be thinking these. This is going to be the natural steps of businesses wanting to come to Iran, wanting to do this. What guarantees do these Western businesses and investors have to uh, to the sustainability and the state and the political risk in the nation? What's what's what 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 would stop um, uh, you know the supreme leader from nationalizing specific industries because they can see that this is now uh, this is uh, tipping into you know dominant control of specific industries. Surely a deal with the United States is one very good step because it shows confidence in this, and typically a deal of this magnitude will take a long time to 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 uh, to um, implement. 
and with that time, you'll be able to trust in the fact that this is something that they both agree to. But tomorrow, the Iranian establishment can say, hey, hold on, you know, America's business interests or Europe's business interests or whoever are becoming too big. Uh, so we're going to nationalize this industry. We're going to nationalize this company. Do you think about this yourself when thinking about the opening up of Iran? Or is this something that you think is too far-fetched and won't really happen because the Iranian establishment will see the benefits of this? And we'll try to work maybe behind the scenes with these companies to make sure that they actually have political control where uh, where the uh, the big industries may have uh, economic and financial um, you know interest. Look, I think it will it will go. Uh, it's a hard question, I know, but this is something that I've been thinking towards, about as well, and naturally yeah. investors are probably thinking about this yes, as well. Absolutely. So look, I think the China model is a likely one. Okay. Where the establishment keeps the control, but it allows the economy to boom and the population to get wealthier. Um, so um, this is this is this is I think this this is a likely model. Another another perspective is um, uh, so look, Iran needs money. Iran needs a lot of investment into everything. Yeah. And this investment will be well spent because this is, you know, for example, infrastructure. This is the deal that they're actually discussing with the Chinese. Yeah. China offered to, to invest $400 billion. It's a lot of money given that GDP of Iran is, well, it's difficult to measure given the currency volatility, but let's say anywhere between $100 and $200 billion. Yeah. And then Chinese come and say, we're going to invest $400 billion over the next 25 years. Yeah. We're going to put it into infrastructure, help you uh, with the um, oil production, but also be build highways, build ports, build um, airports. Iran needs this stuff because this will fuel growth for the next generation, yeah. okay? So, so this is a no-brainer. Yeah. Uh, then, obviously, Iran would have to pay for it to, to China, but they would pay in discounts in oil. Yeah. So Chinese would help them um, um, uh, produce more oil that would otherwise stay in the ground. Mm. So, well, it's a, it's a no-brainer again. Yeah. Um, and they would pay in, in some big discounts in this, in this oil price, yeah. which, 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 which is a fair deal because, as yeah. I said, the, otherwise this oil would just stay in the Naturally. ground. So, um, so, 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 so the establishment understands that they need um, external financing to boost growth long term. They need growth to, um, um, uh, to look, okay, from the very vested interest perspective, half of the Iranian economy is actually controlled by the establishment. Whether this is the central administration, revolutionary guards, um, uh, clerical uh, system, yeah. uh, around half of the GDP. Yeah. Um, it's not that high comparing to many emerging markets. For example, I was speaking with some uh, um, uh, Russian wealthy investors, and they said, "Oh, only half, right? So it's not it's not that high." So, uh, <laughs> um, but 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 that's because Russia is much more dependent on on oil and gas yeah, uh, industry, right? Yeah. And and this is more more diversified. Yeah. Um, so so obviously, when the GDP goes up six times, uh, I guess this is definitely the potential, or or, or even more. Um, in, then um, the establishment would benefit as yeah. well, yeah. right? B yeah. Because they are very they are long the economy yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a big way. Yeah. Um, so so this is the direction now. Whether they would try to control the flows in order to prevent a bubble, well, hard to say. They haven't been in this situation like the, 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 ever, right? So, so, so they don't have a playbook, I guess. Yeah. They would, they would that's, that's what see I was how thinking. the situation exactly. develops. Yeah, they, they need look. The real, the the real trigger will come from the U.S. Iran deal because. This this is needed also for what you mentioned, the inclusion in the global indices like MSCI frontier markets. Iran would be probably 30 or 40 percent of the index, yeah. or it could go straight to MSCI emerging markets because it's big enough and developed enough. Yeah. Um, this will make a lot of passive flows yeah. going into Iran. Yeah. Before this happens, you will have hedge funds, you will have uh, all the, let's say, smart money. Yeah. Right now, um, all who can invest are, you know, European and Asian high net worth individuals, yeah. family offices, yeah. um, maybe some hedge funds, yeah. not really um, um, institutional investors because 
because compliance, whenever there is, again, complex situation, yeah. they will always say no, basically, to be yeah. on the safe side. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, so, so this needs to happen. So for some time, it will be happening, improving gradually. And then if there is like a massive bubble to develop, this would be after the uh, US-Iran yeah. deal. Yeah. So uh, what we are doing, we are positioning our, ourselves um, before all of this even started, right? Yeah, so, for sure. so we are buying companies at five, five times earnings, right? And th- this, this, this will never happen again. I think um, the situation in a couple of years' time will be completely different. Yeah. Listen, the reason I ask this question is because you know Mohammed uh, Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, has said on numerous occasions that the that the Iran uh, nuclear deal, yeah, the JCPOA was signed on the basis of mutual distrust between the parties. And because of this mutual distrust, they overcompensated by making sure that they had um, their positions tightly secured, right? So this was the basis of the Iran deal that was signed in the Obama era. And this mutual distrust, I think, has only grown as the years have passed with the Trump administration who completely ripped up the agreement. And imposed the maximum, you know, pressure policy on Iran. Now, with the Biden administration, what what kind of? Because it would be interesting to see. Because obviously, Biden has 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 has, uh, has chosen his cabinet as it stands. They're going to go through uh, congressional approval as the weeks go by. But let's say they all get passed. What can and is it is it the job of the Biden administration? to build that trust with Iran, or is it on both sides to do that? Because if it took so long to agree the first deal, and also give the fact that the terms of the first deal are running are going to, run, are going to be running out soon, they're going to refresh that with, with contingencies for, for, for future developments or restrictions of their nuclear program, if, they, if, if, if that's what the Americans believe is their final intention. With this mutual distrust developing, I really don't see a way in which Iran can lower its guard, especially with a new administration that's come in, because it took so long to agree it in the first place with the Obama administration. What what are the signals of hope or what are the signals of, of, of confidence that you may see currently from a Biden administration, given the fact that he, he hasn't been in office for a month yet, so we obviously need to give him time to lay out his policies on key issues like China, like Iran, like Russia, like what's going to happen with COVID, um, like many other things also. Um, he's already established uh, executive orders with stopping uh, to stop build to stop build to stop build the um, the, the wall with Mexico, the uh, the oil uh, pipeline deal with Canada has been cancelled also, and many things have been established. But tougher things like Iran, like China, like Russia are still yet to be implemented. Do you see any signals right now? from a Biden administration as to, as to um, what he may do with Iran currently? Or do you still believe we still need to wait and see what he has in terms of his proposals to have any confident assessment over his plans? Mm-hmm. Um, so it would help if, if Biden could show some goodwill. Um, which, um, uh, for example, in the form of um, some sanctions waivers, uh, whether this is on oil sales or on um, yeah, banking connections, uh, so SWIFT connections. Uh, why? Well, one thing, because of this huge huge distrust that, that you mentioned. Um, another thing, another reason is because um, there will be um, a presidential election in Iran soon, in June. Um, and we know that the president will change because the current president, Rouhani, cannot stay for the third term. Um, we don't know, you know, the, the local election system is quite peculiar. So we will know who are the approved candidates maybe around two weeks before the election. So it's too early to tell um, who might, who, who, who is the likely winner. But the parliament is already more conservative after the recent parliamentary election. Uh, so there is a chance that the president will be also, um, um, uh, you know, from uh, more um, um, conservative or hardline uh, f- 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 fraction of a faction of the um, of the political system. Now, um, this is not necessarily bad because a new deal, because of this distrust, 
a new deal will have to be much stronger. So Iranians will know that they cannot rely on anything that can be just ripped off by you know the next president or by the next administration, right? Um, so they will want to have something firm, something that will go through the Congress. Um, it's the same on the Iran side. It may actually be better if conservatives sign something on the Iranian side as well, because this will uh, mean that, yes, obviously, if conservatives agree to it, the, the reformists will also be um, 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 uh, together with them on this. Yeah. Um, so um, so it's, it, it would be good if you could show some, con maybe not concessions, but some goodwill prior to the Iranian election to build some trust. Um, but then, you know, the signals coming from Biden have been have been consistently positive. So he has been saying, uh, repeating that the U.S. should go back to JCPOA without any preconditions, actually, and then build on that. So, as you mentioned, there are some sunset clauses. There are many things that um, they will have to discuss and work on. Uh, but what he has been saying is to go back to JCPOA and then. Um, again, use JCPOA as a platform for, for further uh, negotiations. Uh, so, that, so, so that 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 is obviously a a very positive uh, scenario. Yeah. Um, I guess that Biden's starting position, negotiating position, is actually pretty good because he in inherited everything that you know the bad cop Trump did, put a lot of pressure, and he can now. Um, you know, bring some relief slowly, gradually, in exchange also for compliance um, uh, on the Iranian side mm -hmm. in the matters that are important for Biden, right? Yeah. So I think it will look like this. It would be nice if he started with some goodwill, and then he will be playing um, um, using all the cars that 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 he inherited from Biden. I think, and and the and 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 his team, Biden's team. I mean, a lot of a lot of his team members. Um, were involved in Iran negotiations back in the Obama uh, administration. Yeah. Um, so, 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 and so this is great because not only they understand the topic, but they also have relations with, uh, with, with, with Iranians. Yeah. Look at um, actually the for the first time ever, the U.S. president will have a direct. Uh, I read that it's almost like friendly relationship with Zarif with the yeah. Iranian foreign minister, yeah. because they were working together when Biden was VP, Zarif was um, uh, still a foreign minister, yeah. negotiating JCPOA. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the connection will be there from 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 the start. And 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 this this is a huge opportunity. Yeah. And I think what we'll end on is something which is sort of the elephant in the room, which I almost completely forgot to talk about. And that is the ongoing pandemic that's been going on across the world. I don't know if you've heard of it, <laughs> but um, this has really impacted industries across the world. And needless to say, it's also impacted, um, you know, perceptions of the people to the competencies of the government to handle such a crisis. We saw only a few days ago in the, in the UK, you know, it's had the highest death rate of all nations. It sort of, hit over 100,000 people. When it comes time to the situation in Iran, from the sense that you're getting, has this pandemic impacted business operations there to the point where you see signals of a downturn in the stock market and the economy? And actually, the stock market and, and the economy are two different things. They, they play on two different levels, you know? And it's, it was quite interesting to see in the Western world, the more in the more developed world, you know, unemployment was at its lowest, but markets were at its highest. So complete decoupling there, yes. due to obviously sense, uh, 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 central bank, um, you know, help in that sense. But when it comes time to Iran, do you see a similar um, uh, distortion, or is the situation there different? And what impact do you mm -hmm. think the COVID crisis has had currently, and how will that play out? as this year progresses? Mm -hmm. So um, it looks that the situation is stabilizing in Iran. So they also uh, peaked at, uh, you know, 500, 700 deaths per death related to COVID. Right now it's stabilized around 100. 
uh, it's a 100 in a country of 84 million people. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's, it's not a meaningful number. Um, and uh, well, obviously we are still learning new facts about COVID. So new strains, yeah. uh, we will see, uh, you know, about the vaccinations, the effectiveness in real world and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, but based on what we know so far, it seems that um, that the situation is stabilizing in Iran. Yeah. Um, and they are lucky, you know, because they are a very young population. And the mortality rate was always the highest above 70 years old, right? Or actually the median in Italy, Northern Italy and so on was, was around 80, 81 years old. Right? So Iran uh, with its young population was basically lucky. Not only Iran, many emerging markets. Yeah. Um, this is one thing. Also, they couldn't really afford lockdowns. So there were some policies, but never really properly implemented, which on one hand uh, was a risk to, to health of the population. But again, as I said, they are a young population, so it was a lower risk than in many um, Western countries. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it was also... Um, less brutal for the economy you know so because because um the the industries the companies didn't have to shut down yeah. um so there was there was still an impact and we saw this impact uh, last year um and we realized it uh around mid mid 2020 that because of because of covid the currency depreciated quite a lot uh why because look when the big when the oil exports were halted, basically, or very, very re significantly reduced, mm -hmm. then the main source of hard currency inflows to, to Iran was the regional trade, the regional trade with Iraq, with Afghanistan, whoever. Yeah. And because of COVID, those borders were shut at the beginning. Yeah. So March, April, May, they were shut yeah. and, and there was no trade. So um, um, dollars stopped flowing into the country. On the other hand, you have certain imports uh, of some medicine, of some food products that, that Iran just has to continue importing at whatever the price. Yeah. So uh, on one hand, you had demand for dollars to pay for those very elementary imports. On the other hand, you didn't have supply of dollars. So this created an imbalance yeah. that started, um, uh, that put pressure on the local currency. The local currency started depreciating, you know, dollar going higher. When individual, uh, you know, investors in Iran they see dollar going higher, everyone is buying dollar, so the momentum, you know, creates yeah. the uh, acceleration yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, so, ex exactly. So, uh, so, so that's why you had a, a pretty strong currency depreciation. Then you had some additional um, additional drivers, but but the initial driver, I think, was actually COVID. Um, then the the border situation normalized, so they were limiting very often the, the tourist uh, movement of tourists. But they let the the trading um, uh, crosses border crosses open, uh, and 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 it is the case still today. So I think this uh, this is now under control in terms of the impact on the on the on the real economy uh, and the currency. Uh, the health impact also seems to be stabilized. Um, you know, Iran is a bit of a country like also not only Iran, many emerging markets that couldn't afford a proper lockdown. The virus was spreading like naturally so so without being controlled there could also be the case that maybe in those countries it will take less time to create some sort of immunity uh because it was spreading so fast but mm -hmm. um, um and early but but we will see they will also start uh, soon the 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 vaccination so yeah. well based on the current knowledge uh, that we have on 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 the virus and what's uh, what's out there uh, it seems to be stabilizing yeah i think it's important to mention that this is something when we speak to our clients as well they always ask the question you know post covid what will what would a post covid world look like and you know they are hoping for this to be a blip and for things to get back to normal you know i think that's the most used term in a, in the world that like getting back to normal or the new normal which i completely hate but it's important to realize that the impact of covid on the financial markets is something like it's something that we've never seen before as a source of the problem past you know past uh, bubbles and past um, um, uh, recessions and depressions have happened due to 
you know, financial reasons. This is the first, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of first um, development that we've seen since the Spanish flu, maybe, that has had such a big impact on financial markets. And because those who are in financial markets aren't health experts, they are very limited as to explaining what the future will hold. Because if it was something like the bubble of the real estate bubble in the, in, in the United States, then they could use their expertise to understand what could be the repercussions and what could be the developmental outcomes of uh, such, uh, um, such an instance, right? But when it's a health crisis, your expertise as a financial uh, professional are very mm -hmm. limited. So for you to then project forward as to what the world will look like is really dependent on a knowledge base that you don't have. So unless you have, you know, um, you know, analysts on your teams who used to be doctors or virologists, then it's very difficult for you to have an advantage in this market because the most unpredictable aspect yes, is but, what the virus but, will do but, in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's that's, uh, that's so why I, I have I, I have a I have a comment agree with on the fact it. that um, this is a crisis that we haven't seen for a long long time, and investors are going to have such a blind spot in their analysis because they're not experts in the healthcare industry or they're not ex experts into how um, how this will develop. So that's what I really wanted to end on. But you've given such a great insight into this. Are there any things that you feel that you've missed that you'd like to, uh, to mention before we go? So I have a comment on that. Yeah. I don't think that the pandemic was such a, such a huge black swan coming uh, to the markets because people have been, obviously, the, uh, the range of this was, was enormous, much bigger than you know, the earlier Asian pandemics that we had over the last 20 years or so. Um, but it wasn't that moved the market. It wasn't what moved the market so much. The real black swan were the lockdowns. So not the pandemic, so but do, policies do, do, don't get me wrong. created I'm not saying by that the, I'm not saying that the pandemic was a black swan. I'm saying that, that the markets, do, do, because they don't have expertise in the healthcare implications, they really have a blind spot as to what could happen in the future, as opposed to if this crisis was caused due to a financial innovation gone wrong. This is, this is a health crisis where financial services professionals have no real expertise in this. This is where they're handicapped. Whereas opposed to if it yeah. was created by, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the the housing crisis or the tech bubble or whatever, they know more about what started it and they know how they can get out of it. But when it's something where you have no expertise in, then it's going to take a lot longer for you to acclimatize yourself to the developments. Uh, that's that's the point I was raising. Okay, so so what I'm saying is that the markets were mainly driven by the policy responses, yeah, 100%. Uh, both on the way down That's and right. on the way up. Yeah. So actually, uh, market participants, uh, one thing is that they try to understand the virus and the health issues, but it's equally important for them to understand the potential policy responses and their impact on the yeah. markets, yeah. meaning whether this is their lockdowns or printing of money and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Because it's obviously all connected. You know, the catalyst was the pandemic. The response was the policy that governments put into place and central banks put into place. And then institutional investors, retail investors even respond to that. And that's what causes the circle of the, uh, the investing world. And then you have, uh, and then you have policies uh, that are uh, required to be implemented to respond to the earlier policies. Yeah. To fight whatever <laughs> the unemployment or sure, whatever. Sure. You, go on and on. <laughs> yeah. you go on and on. Um, so this is where we'll wrap it up. If people want to get into contact with you, uh, Mache, what would be the best place? Have you got? Uh, well, we'll post this again, no matter where we put it. But they're open to contact you on LinkedIn, uh, maybe even Twitter if you have it. Um, would you be comfortable yes. in us promoting that for you or not? Absolutely. So I'm on Twitter, uh, not very active, but I am on Twitter. It's at M Voital. So it's yeah. at M W O J P A L. We'll, we'll post all these links. Oh, too. okay. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Or, that's great. Uh, or, through the, or through the website if they would like to um, learn more. Great. Wonderful. Sounds good. Sounds good. And have you got any events that you're attending virtually, at least in the next few months that you, you feel... Uh, the 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 audience may want to participate in. Are you are you talking at any events or are you attending any interesting things that you'd like to promote now? 
So we will be doing a webinar for sure. Mm -hmm. We don't have the details yet, but we will be announcing this uh, through Twitter, LinkedIn for yeah. sure. Um, um, so, mm -hmm. so if you uh, get in touch, connect with us over there, uh, then, then you will get mm -hmm. the information. Macho Wojtel, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Klisman. It was great.